on our second part of our system administration and IT infrastructure course. Um, welcome to Breaking Into IT with AT. And uh, if you could go ahead and like and subscribe, it helps the channel out a lot. Um, we're giving out a lot of jewels, a lot of knowledge about your next job in IT as a system analyst or a system administrator. So uh, stay tuned and um, catch up on some of these jewels and some of this knowledge that we're about to drop today. Um, we're gonna start off today, we went through a couple things on Tuesday. Uh, if you weren't here, um, these are some of the things that we went over. Um, basically, the common tools that you're gonna use in the organization, some common things that you're gonna see. Uh, we pretty much covered Active Directory and a lot of this um, security and uh, firewall and DMZ stuff earlier in the week. So um, now we're gonna hop on the latter end of this and uh, hop into VPNs, um, service management tools, VoIP, Microsoft Office 365. So uh, we'll give you a good overview of a lot of that stuff. We're just scratching the surface with this course, but this is just to expose you to some of the knowledge that you're gonna need to um, utilize on your first day on the job. Oh, where are we at? Uh, yep, all right, let's go to hit VPNs. So we talked a little bit about VPNs earlier in our networking portion of the course. And um, a VPN is basically just a virtual private network. And it's a way to communicate over a network. And essentially it creates a secure tunnel between your device and the internet. It allows you and your data to travel across the internet in encrypted form, which means it can't be read by anybody else. What's up, Nigel? So, um, yeah, VPN, we just started, so um, you actually hopped on at the right time. I just finished up a little intro, and uh, we're hopping into the, we already kind of talked about VPNs in the networking course, but now we're gonna go a little bit more into depth on what a VPN actually is. And um, pretty much everybody, if you've ever worked a remote job, kind of understands that if you need to access like corporate data, that you're gonna have to hop on a VPN to be able to access like certain intranet sites, um, internet being not um, publicly available to um, anybody else on the internet. It's just basically something that's available within your organization, hosted on a web server, maybe in your organization or in the cloud. So um, yeah, VPNs are basically just like an encrypted line of communication. It's a tunnel between your message and your organization, your data and your organization. It uses the internet to do this. So like if you have a bad Wi-Fi connection, that's usually like the first step in troubleshooting um, a VPN issue is maybe disconnecting and reconnecting to a stronger Wi-Fi or um, definitely like maybe even powering off your router and powering your router back on if you're at home and you can do it fairly quickly, then um, yeah, that's a, that's a way to troubleshoot like VPN issues. So just always understand that VPN and your Wi-Fi, your internet, your wireless service, are all connected. So um, here's a step-by-step -step explanation basically on how the VPN works. Um, it's gonna set up a connection request. And when you activate your VPN, it sends a connection request to a VPN server, which could be located in various places around the world depending on the server locations your VPN uh, services provide. And these servers don't have to be, um, anyway. So secure channel establishment is the next, is the next uh, portion of it. So uh, the VPN server responds and creates a secure connection known as VPN tunnel. This tunnel is established using strong encryption protocols. The protocols used may vary, but some common ones include OpenVPN, L2TP, IPsec, uh, PPTP, and most recently, uh, WireGuard. So all of these, if you go into like your network, if you go into like your device um, management settings in Windows, you can actually see like your wireless um, your NIC, all that stuff, your L2TP, your PPT, you can see all that stuff um, under your wireless like connections or something like that in uh, the device manager. And you can actually uninstall, reinstall, update the firmware, um, do a bunch of different things with those. A lot of these involve some sort of encryption, so you'll need um, a code or a PSK, something like that to uh, actually activate it. So that's the um, encryption part of your uh, your security when it comes to a VPN. 
So data encryption, once this is what we're talking about, once the secure connection or tunnel is established, any data that you send from your device is encrypted before it is sent through this tunnel. This encrypted data is unreadable to anyone who might intercept it, such as hackers, your internet service provider, or government surveillance agencies. Um, this is true for the most part, um, but most governments are not going to, or ISPs or anybody who's, like if you're in the legal case and you're fighting a battle against the feds, they're gonna subpoena that uh, VPN service provider and be able to get that information. So yeah, your ISP might not have the data that they're necessarily looking for because they're not tracking you because you're using a VPN to uh, mask your IP, but um, your VPN service provider will um, give up that information if they're subpoenaed. So you wanna try to find a service that doesn't log data and that's kind of a big thing when it comes to VPNs and some, a lot of them advertise that they don't log your data, but they do actually, in fact, log your data. So always be um, conscious of that. Uh, if you're doing something on a VPN that you can be caught, it's not an end all be all when it comes to uh, OPSEC. All right, so we'll go on to uh, the next step in how a VPN works, data transmission. The encrypted data travels through the tunnel to the VPN server. Um, data decryption, the VPN server then decrypts the data and sends it to the destination website or service on the internet. The server also receives back uh, from the website or service, encrypts it and sends it back through the, uh, through the tunnel to your device. So it's re receiving, so it's sending data and then um, it's sending data back basically through that same server, um, which encrypts it. Data reception, when the data reaches your device is decrypted so you can use it. This could be the website you wanted to access, the video you wanted to watch, or the service you wanted to use. So yeah, so you don't always have to be like a super secret hacker to use like VPN services. Regular people use VPN services to watch movies that are available in other parts of the world that aren't necessarily available in their part of the world and a lot of other things like that. Um, so IP masking, <clears throat> this is a big part of what a VPN is. One of the other significant benefits of a VPN is that it masks your IP address when your data arrives at a destination and website or service. It appears to come from the VPN server IP address, not your own. This means that the website or service cannot see your actual IP address or find out your actual location. They can only see the VPN server's IP addresses and location. And most VPN services allow you to like change up where your IP is coming from specifically. You could be in America and say your IP is coming from Russia or it's coming from XYZ. So uh, there's a bunch of different configuration when it comes to VPNs that you can do to um, further mask your IP. But uh, all these steps happen in real time and are nearly seamless to the user, providing an extra layer of security and privacy. It's important to know, however, that while VPN does a lot to improve your security, it isn't foolproof. And they kind of go into the same kind of thing. Um, malware, phishing attacks, uh, if you use a low quality VPN, your data might be might not be completely secure, true. You may have access to your data, so it's crucial to use a trust. So yeah, you gotta trust these people because you're gonna be giving up your data to them. You know, somebody's gonna be logging your data uh, for something, for anything. If you're on the internet, somebody's logging your data, whether it's um, your ISP or whether it's, you know, the VPN service that you're using, somebody has your data. And really, whenever you're putting your data in somebody else's hands, it's really important to know how they uh, secure that data, especially if it's private information. Service management tools, you're gonna run into this like on your first day of the job as a system analyst or system administrator. If, you're, if you hop on um, your first day of onboarding, the first thing that they're gonna show you is your service management tool. And basically an ITSM, an IT service management tool, enables IT operations, organizations, specifically infrastructure and operations um, to better support the production environment. And basically all that is is saying that it's where all your tickets are gonna come in. When you talk about ticketing systems and how you track your work and how you um, track like your documentation and different things, all of that stuff is gonna be inside of your um, service management tool. And so there, here's a couple different examples. You have ServiceNow, Case, um, Zendesk, and these are just some industry standards that people use, and all they do is, um, is show you like a list of all of your tickets, and the tickets will be stuff that's simple. It'll be like, uh, I can't connect to my printer, or um, I can't connect to my VPN, things like that, all are gonna be listed in here. 
and also you'll have a knowledge base somewhere within that um, service management tool. So most organizations, if they're a larger organizations, have, have a significant knowledge base. Um, smaller to mid-level organizations, I find, don't necessarily have as, as an extensive knowledge base, but um, that could be a great opportunity as an incoming analyst or administrator to kind of make an impact early is to um, contribute to that knowledge base on a regular basis. You know, it, it definitely set me apart and it, and it put me ahead. It could definitely help anybody else who def who wants to, um, you know, work in support or work in infrastructure. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time on that, but uh, we will talk about VoIP. VoIP stands for Voice Over Internet Protocol. It's technology that allows you to make voice calls using a broadband internet connection instead of a regular or um, analog phone line. VoIP services convert your voice into a digital signal that travels over the internet. And um, I didn't know this until I was like 29, but uh, the lady who invented VoIP, uh, Marion Croak, she actually um, invented VoIP back in the day, and she's a black woman. You know, she's she's working with Apple right now. I think she's really, um, really, really senior in Apple. Well, let me find a good picture of her. But yeah. This is her right here. I learned about this Black History Month, National Inventors Hall of Fame. Shout out to Marion Croak doing her thing in the space, but she invented VoIP. Um, and here's how it works. Um, your voice input, when you speak into a VoIP device, so basically VoIP is, it covers like Teams, Zoom, like we're on right now, this is VoIP. Um, what else? WebEx. Like there are a bunch of different voice over IP companies that basically all you have to do is download an application and you're able to use it and it operates um, like a telephone. So you're able to communicate over the internet. Um, when you speak into voice over IP devices, like a VoIP enabled phone, computer, or smartphone, your voice is converted into digital data packets. Data transmission, these data packets are sent over internet using internet protocol. This transmission can occur between VoIP devices from a VoIP device to a traditional phone and vice versa. Data conversion to output, when the data packets reach their destination, they're converted back into audio. If the receiving end is, to, is a standard telephone, if the receiving end is another VoIP device, the digital packets can remain in their digital form. So as you can see, it's versatile, so it can reach um, both analog and digital um, devices. The key advantage of VoIP is that it often provides significant cost uh, savings over traditional phone systems, as the internet is a much cheaper medium for sending data tr compared to traditional phone lines. Yeah, if you if all you have to do is download an application, and I don't have to send everybody in my corporation a telephone, a physical phone, um, of course I'm going to go with that over like sending. So people, we have we have phones I, in most environments. You still have. Um, physical phones and things like that, but it's just becoming more and more outdated. There are some people who want like kind of individual numbers, but when it comes to communicating internally, at least, um, VoIP is the easiest way to go. Uh, so yeah, it's versatile. It provides features like call forwarding to multiple devices, voicemail to email, transcription, and more. Um, however, VoIP is dependent on good internet connection. So if you have low quality bandwidth, or unreliable internet connection, you might experience poor call quality or drop calls. Calls. VoIP can also be impacted by power outages as it relies on the internet connection and power supply to function, whereas traditional phone lines often continue to work during power outages. Uh, this is a big part of the job when you first come in as well. Um, asset management, you know, they usually kind of kick this off to the new guy. Everywhere I've been, I've always kind of been a part of asset management to an extent. And uh, it's basically the easy work. This doesn't really require a lot of technical knowledge. It just requires you to be organized and to write things down, to collect serial numbers, to um, you know have a centralized place where everybody can see who has what and uh, where it goes. Even if it's just a spreadsheet with every uh, serial number for every laptop in the organization that you let out, that you deployed in the last six months. You gotta have some sort of information because these companies calculate that when it comes to loss, um, 
there's certain tax benefits to um, doing certain things, and people want to, you know, people want to cash in on that. So asset management is a big part of your job. You can make your CTO look really good. You can make everybody around you look really good um, as long as you stay on top of things. So inventory management in IT um, context refers to tracking and managing the hardware and software assets within the organization. This includes everything from servers, computers, laptops, peripheral devices to software licenses and cloud resources. So a lot of um, cloud services like Office 365, and um, everywhere, ADP, Adobe, all of these have different licenses that you uh, can administer through an administrative uh, portal. So if you are a system administrator, um, that is essentially your job to administer um, different resources and different licenses to different people. And you'll be able to do that um, on a software level as well as on a hardware level as when you're deploying machines and things like that. Proper inventory management can help a company track its assets, understand how they are being used, maintain them properly, and budget for the future purposes, purchases. Here are the key components of IT inventory management. Asset tracking, the first step in IT inventory management is to know what you have. So yeah, you gotta have um, an idea, and you can do this on a software level. You can do this uh, manually just on Excel. You can, um, in a Terra, at least if you have a Terra agents deployed, you know, you can tell where all of your devices are and there's other tools that you can um, use to do inventory um, and asset tracking to an extent automatically. Um, life cycle management, this involves tracking each asset from acquisition through disposal. And so uh, you got to have a plan for what's going to happen over the course of time when it comes to uh, your assets. So certain assets run out of warranty after like three years or four years. So if you want a replacement for this asset, you need to send it in before this warranty is up if there's something going on with it. You can save a company a lot of money by simply being able to um, understand when warranties are coming up um, and how they affect uh, what your actual inventory is right now. So if you got a couple computers laying around and they're still in warranty, you could probably send those back and get those replaced. Um, so life cycle management, you definitely want to keep track of, or if you're at a company long enough, of what the life cycle of, of is a device. So uh, for the most part, I would say three to five years, you want to kind of switch devices up and get something new. That's just by recommendation. Um, some organizations may not feel like that, you know, depending on the size and what they're trying to do. But um, for larger organizations, I would I would say people should definitely be going in every three to five years to um, to upgrade devices and things like that. Software license management, we kind of already talked about that, where there's an actual portal on the software level. Or there's some type of admin console where you can go in and you can uh, manage your software, like Office 365, you can manage um your different licenses and things, whether it's an E1 or E3 license, you know, one is just for email and one is for email and applications. So you're giving people different access, you're administering different things with asset management. Um, security and compliance, inventory management systems can help track which software versions are installed on devices, aiding and ensuring all software is up to date and patched for security vulnerabilities. And this all comes to having a centralized logging system and that's uh, one thing that is huge in any uh, IT department is that you want to have something that logs data from devices um, remotely in one centralized place. So you can go through and look at devices on a granular level. Um, if you don't have access to them on a hands on level, you can at least go through uh, the logs and try to see like what's going on. If it's having a trouble booting up or if it's having trouble um, updating certain things like that may be available in those logs. So um, you definitely want to make sure things are up to date because hackers um, kind of bank on you not keeping things up to date and uh, not having the most up to date operating system or software that um, is not susceptible to a vulnerability. They might have pushed a patch that would fix this vulnerability, but just because you haven't updated yet, your system is um, able to be compromised. Budgeting and forecasting. So um, by understanding what assets are currently in use, their life cycle stages and organizations' future needs, IT departments can forecast future expenses for replacing aging hardware or acquire new software licenses. 
Yeah, this is never like a good conversation in IT. I mean, for the most part, it just depends on where you're at and what their needs are. But um, if you're at a company that is focused on growth, then budgeting and forecasting is going to be huge because you're going to have to uh, be able to come up with certain deliverables and they might not be spot on. You know, these are just quotes and things that people give you, but at least having an idea of what it might cost um, to get the kind of growth that, you know, this organization may need is going to be a huge thing when it comes to moving forward. Um, integration with other systems. Uh, yeah. A lot of times people have legacy systems, old systems. If you ever hear legacy, just always think old. And um, these legacy systems here will uh, need to be integrated with new applications. So say you have a uh, say you have a system that's on. I almost said something. I'm like, I don't. Know, there's certain information. I don't. Know, I don't want to give up. But um, just because it's information that anybody can use to compromise what you're doing, you know, on the job and certain things. So. If you have a legacy system in your in your organization, just know it could it could potentially be the security surface that gets compromised later on in the future. But also, it can be a hassle to integrate new uh, services and new uh, databases and things, whatever you want to use on these uh, old old systems. So, <clears throat> an IT inventory management system might integrate with other systems like the IT service management system, which is the service management tool that you use to uh, manage your time and manage your tickets, um, configuration management databases or network management systems for a comprehensive view of all IT resources. It's basically just saying everything has to be compatible. And a lot of the times, because most things are web-based nowadays, they are compatible in a sense because they're, they're through the internet. But um, yeah, if you have certain things that are local to your organization that are legacy or old, then yeah, you might have to worry about compatibility. An effective IT inventory management system helps businesses avoid unnecessary purchases, achieve economies of scale, maintain regulatory compliance, and improve productivity by ensuring necessary resources are available when needed. Technologies like barcoding, RFID, and software agents are often used to facilitate the tracking of these assets. So like we said earlier, um, software agents, you know, barcodes, all that stuff is going to be used in your inventory. Um, compliance is going to be a big thing. We're going to talk about when we come, uh, we edge kind of closer into security. Uh, we're going to go over a little bit of that next week. So, you know, just kind of be familiar with what these things are, like RFID, um, things like radio frequency ID or something, and software agents. Uh, familiarize yourself with some of those things. Printers and uh, peripherals. Printer scanners and other peripherals are essential tools in any corporate environment. Um, it sucks to work with them. They are the bane of you know everybody's existence because they are just always temperamental and they're moody. Uh, they facilitate various operations such as printing reports or scanning documents for digital storage and sharing. In the corporate setting, these devices often need to be shared across many different users and potentially across multiple locations, which require more advanced networking and device management technologies. Um, whenever you go in somewhere, so like this is a key infrastructure thing, like if you're setting up network pr uh, printers, aka you're setting up printers that are shared on um, your network in your organization. So you have a printer that's kind of either wirelessly sharing or uh, through an ethernet cable sharing. So you want to give that printer a static IP and you want to do that because you don't want the server trying to resolve a new IP for um, for the printer every time you want to connect. You kind of want to know where your uh, printer is on the network at all times so that everybody sharing it can find it easily. So um, you want to go ahead and give it a static IP. So if you ever fly out on a trip with an MSP and you're setting up, you know, some old ladies, uh, room in her home in her old folks home and you you know they use a shared printer for the administration you want to make sure that that thing's on a static ip address so that um, people in the organization can share that printer and um, print to that printer so in a network every device is assigned an ip address so it can communicate with other devices this ip can either be dynamic which is dhcp or static for uh, devices like printers and scanners, a static IP is usually preferred because it provides a consistent address for all network computers to send print or scan jobs. If the printer or the scanner had a dynamic IP, its address would change over time and the computers would lose connection. Yep, causing interruptions in the ability to send uh, scan jobs, print jobs until they were updated with the new IP. Um, 
Yeah, so pretty much what I said, you know, if you don't put it on a static IP, good luck finding it. Um, print servers. A print server is dedicated. It's a device that connects printers to client computers over a network. It accepts print jobs from the computers and sends the jobs to the appropriate printers. Print servers can be dedicated devices, but they can also be general purpose computers or network storage devices that manage print jobs in addition to other, other tasks. So, yeah, you can... Um, Store your print server on like network attached folders or drives. Um, you can do a bunch with print servers. Print servers uh, usually always end up having issues with them. Um, they're not that hard to set up, but uh, a lot of times they don't work. Man. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Everywhere I've been, it's like everybody always has a print server, but the print server always is the thing that acts up or goes down or just, there's always some issue with the print server everywhere I've been, literally everywhere. Um, what else? Oh, centralization. So print server. So this is just basically the, um, like the benefits of having a print server. It provides a centralized point for the control for all printers in the network. So yeah, it does make it easy to just be able to connect to the, in theory, to be able to just connect to the print server and then connect to any network device that you want. But um, it doesn't always work out like that. Um, efficiency with the print server print jobs can be executed without a computer needing to maintain a connection to a printer throughout the job freeing up resources for other tasks okay that's uh, that's cool flexibility print servers can allow jobs to be sent to any printer on the network provided flexibility and redundancy if one printer fails or is busy jobs can be redirected to another printer um, cost effective using print servers can be cost effective especially in large organizations it reduces the needs for each workstation to have a dedicated printer um, in summary, using static IPs for printer scanners and other peripherals along with utilizing print service allows for efficiency management, reliable connectivity, and resource optimization in the corporate environment. So yeah, it is just basically good for corporate. <clears throat> and now we'll go through, uh, with this last 10, 15 minutes, we'll talk about some uh, common troubleshooting um, and hardware problems. So this is important right here because this is basically what your interviews are going to be hinged upon. Like when you're going for these jobs, people want to know what you um, are able to do and they want to know what your experience is like and if you've ever ran into anything that's similar to their organization. So <clears throat> if you're having problems with your hardware, then the underlying operating system is not going to be able to work very well either. So in this module, we'll look at troubleshooting some common hardware problems. So we'll just step through a couple common ones and they shouldn't take too long. This is kind of like your best practice, your methodology that you want to use whenever you're enter, whenever you're entering into a situation where um, you have a problem. This is kind of like the best practices. You want to identify the problem. So first you want a person like you want to get as much detail on the problem as you can. You want to understand like how long have you been experiencing this problem? Is anybody else around you experiencing this problem? These are things that you need to know um, in order to identify kind of what the problem is. Is there like an error message or anything that you could send me maybe a screenshot or, or a screen recording of, of what you're seeing of what's going on? Um, you know, identify the problem. That's step number one. Then you want to establish a theory of probable cause. Uh, you want to question the problem. So that's basically, that's what you're doing. You're kind of trying to fish for, you know, how it ends, how the problem kind of started. And with experience, you'll be able to kind of go through these steps a little bit faster and you'll kind of know because you know from experience what problems do what, but um, you want to establish a probable cause uh, a theory. <clears throat> then you want to test the theory. So, you know, if you're testing the theory, you want to see if what you were saying is right. If it only happens when you're connected to your VPN, then turn your VPN off. That would be a way to test the theory. And if it works when the VPN is off, then um, you know you can establish a plan of action. Um, and the plan of action is maybe disconnect your VPN and then try to reconnect it again, and maybe it'll work. So you're establishing a plan of action to resolve the problem. And then you want to implement it, um, verify the full system functionality. So you want to you know, make sure that everything works and then you want to document document your findings, actions, and outcomes. Remember, we talked about documentation. You want to document things that, you know, kind of gave you problems or gave you um, trouble because in the future, somebody else might have those same problems and you never know. You know, you could be 
saving somebody a whole lot of time as opposed to them having to figure it out all, like just like how you did. Um, given a scenario, you want to troubleshoot problems related to motherboards, RAM, CPU, and power. Um, the only overarching concept in this subdomain is that of uh, common symptoms. So the common symptoms of the problems related to motherboards, RAM, CPUs, and power cover 12 items. They range from power, uh, they range from power on, self-test beeps, post uh, overheating. So post is how your uh, computer boots up, and that's the uh, test about everything. So once you ha hear that beep, you know that test is, uh, it either failed, you know, there's there's always some sort of, like it's like three beeps, or one beep pause, and then another beep pause. You'll just know that something is wrong from that, from that post, uh, from that post beep overheating. Um, overheating is a common one with power. Maybe your um, PSU is, is over is overheating. You know, maybe your uh, CPU is overheating. If your computer gets too hot and your CPU overheats, it'll damage it. So um, you always want to make sure that your computer is not overheating. You could damage pretty much every component in there if it gets too hot. <clears throat> Grinding noises and continuous. Reboots to uh, application crashes. That's like your hard, your hard drive. Usually, if you have um, grinding noises, um, if you have a grinding noise in your hard drive, uh, you might want to back up your data as fast as you can. Um, continuous reboots in your computer and application crashes is also like a hard drive thing. So you might want to check like your firmware updates on your hard drive. Try to update the firmware on your hard drive in your computer first. And then if something, if it keeps continuing to do that, then it's probably failing. Um, a burning smell, if you got dust in your computer on your motherboard, it can catch on fire. So, you know, you always want to uh, manage the amount of dust that you have. You uh, Optimally, you, would, you don't want any dust in your computer, but um, if you have dust in your computer, um, it's definitely bound to catch on fire. Um, capacitor swelling and inaccurate system date time. Inaccurate system date time, you know, your CMOS battery is uh, something's wrong with that because that's what handles um, your time and stuff like that. So these are things that we kind of went over throughout the course, but uh, just it's always good to do a quick reminder. Um, you know, certain things, you know, when you go through life and you have experience, you'll learn that these things are going to, you know, become self self evident to you. You know, it's going to be easy to recognize what's going on. Um, Hard drives and RAID arrays. We kind of talked about hard drives a little bit. Um, the only concept covered by the Southern Main Group covers 10 items related to hard drive and RAID array troubleshooting. These items range from grinding noises, clicking noises. Like I said, you better back it up. You hear grinding, clicking, you know. <laughs> Don't start dancing. This ain't a slow jam. But you better back this up, you know. And RAID failure to missing drives in operating systems and self-monitoring analysis and reporting technology, um, smart failure. So um, the thing about RAID is if your drive is failing, RAID, uh, some RAID configurations allow for hot swapping. So um, if a drive is failing, you can pretty much swap it out without having to turn it off and then, you know, replace it with another drive and then have that data um, still be saved on that other drive and still be moved around. So always be aware of like what configuration of RAID you're working with, if you can hot swap or not. Um, if you hear clicking and grinding, that ain't a slow jam. You gotta back that thing up. Given a scenario, troubleshoot video projector and display issues. Um, the only concept here is symptoms. These common symptoms range from incorrect data source, dead pixels and fuzzy images to display burn and intermittent projector shutdown. Um, yeah, it's shutting down and stuff. You know, check your power, display burn, you know, for projectors, pretty much once that bulb is out, you know, the projector's over with. The bulb costs just about as much as the projector. You might as well just go ahead and get a new one. Um, if you can't fix it with like the resolution and, uh, you know, maybe some settings, maybe some different like resolution settings that you can use, but yeah, no projectors. Once that battery's out, just go ahead and get another one. Given a scenario, troubleshoot common issues with mobile devices. Um, yeah, poor battery health, swollen battery. You might want to change the battery. Improper charging and overheating. You want to, you know, maybe clean out that port that you use to charge the phone first and see 
Um, maybe if something there is going on or maybe there's something wrong with the battery. Physically damaged ports, malware, cursor drift, touch calibration. That's more so like drivers, stuff like that. You can update. Um, you can just update your computer for a lot of this stuff. Well, not this stuff. This is... Can you guys hear that? Can you hear that? Yes, yeah, people outside. I want to let them pass. Uh, this subdomain. Yeah, it's usually this is this looks like hardware issues. It's just battery. You know, everybody knows if your phone's getting fat. You want to swap that battery that battery out if the power is. You know, if it's charging really fast but it's dying really fast. Usually there's something wrong with the battery. <clears throat> printers. Printers are the worst, man. Printers are the worst. I hate working with printers. Every time somebody calls me with a printer issue, I know it's just like, I just pray that I'm not going to be on the computer for long. Um, some, some consider printers the bane of help desk and desktop support. If you're in this camp, this subdomain may be useful on your job. The common sense was in this subdomain cover 12. Items ranging from lines down to printed page, paper jams, faded print, and paper not feeding the speckling, uh, speckling on printing pages, incorrect color settings, and incorrect page orientation. A lot of this stuff, uh, they do go over a lot of like the hardware symptoms and the CompTIA A plus and things like that. But honestly, like on the job, most print issues that I see are people not being able to connect to printers, um, print servers, people, uh, for some reason, printers disconnecting from devices after not being around them for a while. Um, yeah, mostly it's just connection. There are some like runoff printer issues that you go to like the print properties for and um, you may have to add a printer or two. It's just, yeah, most of the time it's connection issues with printers. I don't see a lot of the like hardware issues. I see a lot of the like the software level issues where you have to maybe add somebody. So um, a lot of printers like network printers, since they have static IP, you can go ahead and throw that IP into your search bar on any one of your browsers and you can log in to the portal for that uh, printer if you're on the network. And, um, once you log into the printer, you can add people to an email list, a contact list, or a frequently used list. There's different things you can do. There's a lot of different cool stuff that you can do with printers, um, but for the most part, they're a pain in the ass to work with. If you ever run into a printer issue and somebody says, uh, my printer's not printing with color or it's not printing, always check the driver first. Try to check the driver. Um, if you ever are connecting with a print server and you're having trouble connecting with the print server, Try to connect using the TCP IP option in the um, manual printer uh, connection like option when you go to printers and scanners, different things like that. You can, you can do a bunch of different things with printers, honestly. Uh, we could have a whole course on printers. Troubleshoot uh, problems with wired and wireless connections, um, slow internet, intermittent connectivity, um, limited connectivity. If you're in a home network, a lot of times I would say just reboot your router. <laughs> you know, most of the time, 90% of the time, that's going to fix that issue. Um, if you're in a business environment, you know, you may have to check um, different things on like your Meraki dashboard and check like ports and see how everything is c t talking and connecting with each other. And go. It, it, connectivity is, is really, really deep. Um, and we will cover a little bit more in like, I'll, I'll do like a whole course on like networking and things like that. But uh, yeah, for the most part, reboot the router. You know, on the, as, a, as an entry level system analyst, try to, you can't necessarily do that in an organization, but for a lot of times when people are talking about internet issues, they're talking about issues from home. They're not talking about the corporate internet, you know. Here's some resources. You can do some more troubleshooting um, on Quizlet. Uh, resources on the different uh, CompTIA domains of five networking troubleshooting, uh, some more troubleshooting stuff. Actually, let's see what this is. I got a bunch of stuff on here. Certification prep. You can come down here. Probably got the A plus right here. Let's see what the A plus is talking about. Yep, so you can come in here and find like some of these procedures. 
mobile devices, yep, networking. Yeah, man, so you can come here for a lot. So it looks like a great resource. Uh, yeah, of, course. of course, we've got our guy, Professor Messer, in here. Can't miss. Then we've got some Quizlet in here. And we're actually right on time right now with 7.15. I had a one-week study streak. Oh, man. Let me put me out there, Quizlet. I'll be studying more than once a week. So, uh, yeah, definitely hop on Quizlet. Hit some of these flashcards right here. Let's see what the test is talking about. Yeah, man, stay up to date with this stuff. There's a lot of stuff in here and then also in the... Also in the slides. All right, this isn't working. Um, yeah, like if you go through here, you'll see a week of we on seven, eight. We got about a month left. We got one month left. It's our last month. But you can see some projects, set up a remote help desk environment. Um, if you're, if you've got like a friend who's got another computer, you know you can send them this link. I think this goes to SpiceWorks. Yes, yeah, SpiceWorks. But SpiceWorks will give you the um, insight. You can go to. Let's see. I utilize the search bar so often. People always are like, how are you finding this stuff? I'm like, man, I'm not sitting down searching. Let's see. Yeah, here we go. This is a link. So just go to Google Spicework Remote Support. This is what the page looks like. If you got a friend, you can send them, start a remote session. You send them the link, send them the uh, page to go to, and then you can hop on their computer and control their computer for a little while. So, you know, it's kind of a fun game to play. They got to click now, they got to click through a bunch of screens. So it's not like this is something that you can use to like hack somebody's computer, but. Um, it's definitely cool to kind of get the concept of what you'll be doing on the job, you know, operating in a remote help desk environment where you have to connect to people's computers to help troubleshoot their stuff. Um, oh yeah, it talks about backing stuff up. Definitely best practices for backing up, to managing storage. That's going to be a huge part of your job. Uh, managing Active Directory. We talked about Active Directory and um, Azure earlier in the course. Yeah, man. So we're almost through this course, man. We've got security and job prep next. And uh, we're going to get on out of here. We've got a bunch of stuff. We'll go over resume updates. Yeah, crazy to think. We're almost out of here, man. So I appreciate you showing up. Um, I'll see you next week, I guess, next Tuesday. Go ahead and study up. You know, stay up to date on this stuff. And uh, keep working because we're almost there. So, you know, you should kind of have a good idea of like what um, it's going to come in the future for you as far as like job placement and job, um, like things that you're going to need, the prerequisites for um, working in the in the environment. I think you if you've followed throughout the course up to this point and you kind of understand the industry knowledge and the industry terminology that um, that shoot that you can get a job in, in IT easily as an entry level, you know, system analyst um, somewhere. And then, you know, you grow your skills and eventually 
you make it on to uh, the system administration or, you know, the cybersecurity or whatever track you choose to pursue. So I'm going, going to go ahead and uh, end the meeting here. You know, I appreciate you for showing up. And uh, I'll see you again next week, man. Good luck, All right, brother. bro. Yeah. Thanks, man. No problem. Bye-bye. Recording.